All right, tonight we begin a four-part sermon series entitled In Spirit and Truth, The Fundamentals of Biblical Worship. Haven't had a series in a while. I certainly haven't done one in a while, and I'm happy to kind of get into this topic. The first session, we're going to examine the nature of worship, which is communication. My prayer is that the end result of this series will not simply be that we have you know, more information about worship, but that our own experience of worship will be broadened, enhanced, hopefully changed to the glory of God and to our own personal edification as well as the building up of the church. It's the one thing we all do together. So we have a youth group and the you know, golden agers go this way and the, you know, we have different activities, but worship is the thing we do all together and we do it each week together. And this is an attempt to kind of broaden that and give it more perspective. Can anyone here remember where the last Olympic games were held? Anybody? You're right, Rio. <laughs> Rio de Janeiro, that were the last Olympic Games. You ever wonder what the Olympics are about? You know, when you cut through the hype and the marketing as well as the politics, the entire experience of the Olympics is about competition. I mean, the Olympic Games is motivated by you know, and lives off of the idea of competition. Countries compete for the chance to host the best, the most elaborate show. And athletes sacrifice their lives to compete with one another to become the best in the world in one moment of time at one particular sport. You know, the idea of fostering brotherhood, openness, friendship, these are all side items to the true spirit of the Olympics which is competition on a worldwide scale. That's what it's about. So in a broad sense, you could say that the nature of sport is competition. You play to win. Now, I'm saying this because in each area of endeavor there is an essential nature or there's a core idea that explains and makes sense of the activities that surround us, or that surround it, rather. That's why in sports, great coaches never forget that sport is about competition, not fame or money or politics. They know the core issue, competition, and they never let their, prayer, uh, their players get away from this idea. I mean, little children, they can play for fun or the love of the game or to build character, but professionals, especially successful ones, know that it's about com uh, competition, it's about winning. So knowing the essential nature of something is important if you are to be successful at it. That's my point. For example, the essential nature of school is, yeah, education. <laughs> education, believe it or not. <laughs> when I worked at Oklahoma Christian University as Dean of Students, I witnessed so many people fail because they hadn't grasped this core idea yet, that school was about education. I mean, they came to college, they joined the social service clubs, they signed up for intramural sports, they rejoiced in the fact that there were between 800 and 1200 single males or single females wandering around every day, they were happy about that. They dated, they played video games in the dorms till 4 a.m., they hung out at the lounge, and oh yeah, they went to class, that too. And then all of a sudden, the five-week grades were sent home to parents, and Junior had two C's, one D, one F, and an incomplete grade because his assignments weren't turned in, and that's when reality hit. This is when it began to dawn on students that despite all the extracurricular activities taking up their time, college was about getting a structured education. That was the core idea. Nobody got a diploma for ping pong, no matter how good you were. Those who succeeded at Oklahoma Christian were those who understood the essential nature of that place 
and gave themselves over to it. And that was getting an education. I mean, I could go on and on with other examples. The essential nature of business is profit. No profit, no business. It's not about titles or offices or networking or advertising or bookkeeping. All these things are parts of business. They support the basic or core element of business, which is profit. You know, sometimes I'm with someone and we see some shabby looking store or restaurant and the person with me will say, man, why are these people stay, staying open? How come they're still open? I mean, what a dump. And my answer is always the same. That business is open because they're turning a profit, period. They're making money. The only institution that stays open when it's not making money is the government. Okay, so following this line of thinking, I suggest to you that the essential nature of worship is communication. That's the point. Communication with God. From the first elementary examples of people worshiping God in Genesis, to the exalted images given to us by John in the book of Revelation, Worship has had one common thread, the effort that man makes to communicate with God in some way. This is evident from observing the actions and words used when people in the Bible are worshiping. Whether it was bowing down or offering sacrifice, or expressing prayers or playing instruments in the Old Testament or singing hymns in the New Testament, eating the Passover or sharing the communion, people were not doing these things for themselves or for other believers. The underlying reason for all of these things and more was that God was listening. God was watching. Somehow God was receiving the message of faith and love and appreciation and repentance and need from those trying to communicate it to Him here on earth. Now, what's interesting about this is that communication with God is the essential nature of every type of worship, not just Judeo-Christian worship. You know, the Muslim pilgrims going to Mecca, what do they want to do? They want to communicate with Allah. The Hindus who wash in the Ganges River do this right. Why? To connect with Brahma, the first god of the Hindu trinity and creator of the universe. Native Americans use sweat lodges to help them be more attuned to their spirits and to their gods. Zoroastrians of ancient times lit fires to honor their god Zoroaster. Now I'm not saying that all of these methods are effective and even acceptable to the God of creation, the Father, the Lord, Jesus Christ. What I'm saying, um, I'm simply saying rather that the essential nature of worship is communication. Man trying to communicate in some manner with the divine. This is the basic premise. This is the core idea that informs and gives meaning to the other activities that surround worship. Thankfully, we have the revelation of God through Christ in His word to teach us about all things, including worship and how we can truly communicate with God in spirit and in truth. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 13, Paul writes, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints 
in light, for He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. So what is Paul saying essentially? In Christ we gain the ability, the wisdom, and the knowledge to not only live in a way that pleases God, but to worship or to communicate with Him as well. This is part of the inheritance that we receive in Christ. Part of the blessings, part of the gifts that we receive in Christ is the ability to communicate with the true and living God. A gift that others do not have. As, uh, as Marty said this morning, there are many brides, but not all the brides are the brides of the king. They're not all brides of God, and I'm essentially saying the same thing. Yeah, there's a lot of attempts at communication being made, but it's only within Christ that communication to God becomes successful. And that's what Paul, one of the things he's saying here, that's one of the gifts that we receive as Christians, the ability to communicate with the true God. Now, I spent a good portion of time tonight setting up this basic premise that the essential nature of worship is communication. Why is this so important? Well, it's important because not knowing or forgetting or not prioritizing this core idea leads us into worship that is not in spirit and that is not in truth. Like a coach you know, who forgets about the essence of competition or business people who neglect the bottom line of profitability. Churches who ignore the fact that worship is basically about communication lose the benefit of worship which is transcendence. And that'll be the topic of my last lesson in this series. Now churches, when it comes to worship, make one of two basic mistakes when it comes to public worship. First of all, they make the means the end. In other words, the idea of communication is lost or subverted by the methods of communication. For example, um, uh, it's like buying an expensive computer with lots of software, all kinds of gadgets, but not bothering to hook it up to the internet. Yeah, it's great, we have an impressive computer, but it cannot communicate with anyone except the owner. Churches do this when so much attention and cost is focused on the place of worship, the equipment to worship, the order of worship, the method of worship, and so on and so forth, but no effort to examine if there is communication with God through all of this. We think that if we get the method right, then communication takes place. But having the right method is only part of what is required to actually communicate with God. For example, it's like saying that to compete in football, you have to make sure every player has his name on his jersey and knows and follows the rules of the game. Well, having the equipment and knowing the rules enables you to play, but you need more than that if you're going to win. In the same way, knowing the method and following the rules qualifies as worship, but it doesn't guarantee that you actually communicate with God and receive the true blessings as a result. I'll talk about some other things necessary to actually worship in the next lesson. That's why it's a series. I can't fit all of this information to a single lesson, so I'm kind of breaking it up into four. So that's num mistake number one. We make the means the end. Mistake number two, we make up our own methods. In his book, Christianity's Dangerous Idea, author Alistair McGrath states that Pentecostalism accounts for most of the growth in Christianity in the last 50 years. His research shows that the Pentecostal movement or the charismatic movement is larger than all other evangelical groups put together and that includes restoration churches like ours. In worldwide Christianity, and I use the term Christianity loosely here, in, in worldwide Christianity, 
There's Catholicism, and then there's Pentecostalism, and then there's everybody else. That's how it breaks down. Now what's really interesting in McGrath's uh, theory, he's a, he's a professor of historical theology at Cambridge University uh, in England. What's really interesting in his theory is why this is so, why the growth that they've had in this particular group. And he says that unlike other groups who have religious framework to function within, the, Pente the Pentecostal churches don't have this. In other words, Catholics, for example, have church history and church law and the cardinals vote and the pope's encyclicals as well as the Bible to guide and to restrict or to permit what they will or will not do. And that includes in public worship. If they want to see, can I do this, can I do that? Well, there are all kinds of references to guide them. Uh, what the Pope says, what the Bible says, what the Cardinals say, what church history says. You know, they look at all of these things in making up their minds. We, in the churches of Christ, uh, as opposed to in the Catholic uh, system, we only use the Bible uh, and have a framework of rules to guide our interpretation as well as widely accepted traditional teachings that permit or restrict our actions. You know, we have a reason we don't use instruments in public worship. There's Bible teaching for that and there's experience and history and so on and so forth. You know, we have something to guide us when it comes to these things. Pentecostals on the other hand have none of these. Their teachings are fluid, and take into consideration the needs and circumstances of the moment, especially when it comes to public worship, because I'm, I'm you know, keeping my comments focused on public worship. Now I mention this because they are an excellent example of the ones who make up their own methods and rules about worship. They are the polar opposites of those who, whose worship is all about rules, like us. So for Pentecostals, whatever it takes to make the worship dynamic, emotional, meaningful, entertaining, spiritual, it's all okay because nothing is holding them back as far as method is concerned. The problem, of course, is that they define communication with God based on their methods, not on the results authenticated by the Bible. They're not worried about that. They're not looking in the Bible to see, is this okay? Or if we do that, is that okay? Or if we bring in a drama group and they dance and they jump around, is that okay? No. No, no, they're looking, does it work? Does it bring people through the doors? Do people leave you know, excited, pumped up, saying, man, that was great? You know, it's like a hockey team judging their success by the color of their uniforms and the quality of the pregame show and not the final score. Their mistake, I believe, my humble opinion, is that they judge the effectiveness of worship by the way that they feel about the worship itself rather than how the worship affects how they feel about God. In the churches of Christ, there is in some quarters, a desire to go this route and justify the means for the end as well. A lot of congregations in our brotherhood sensing that they are not getting the benefits of worship, not accomplishing the core goal of worship, which is communication, are beginning to tinker with the methods or the rules, thinking that this is going to make a difference. So they add instruments, or they add drama groups, or they add you know, audio visual aids, or worship teams, or they include women in the leadership roles, or they experiment with charismatic ideas like clapping or tongue speaking, even mimicking the lingo of prophecy and special visions. And it's normal that this is what they would try since they believe that the method produces the result. So why not change the method if we want to change the result? Of course, others react to these changes, especially unbiblical changes, and the debate centers on the methods, while nothing really changes except more division and less communication among ourselves and God as well. So we debate and debate and debate over the methods, 
<laughs> but that doesn't improve our communication with God. So we're going to talk more about rules and methods in my next, uh, my next uh, lesson. But for now, let's review the divine requirements for communication with God. If you want to succeed in communicating with God, what must you do? Well, if you want to do that, number one, you have to realize that communication with God must exist personally before it can exist corporately. Jesus trained His apostles in private prayer for three years before they began actually worshiping corporately as a church after His resurrection. If a congregation's worship is not effective, it's usually because the individuals in the church do not know how to worship God privately. And if the leaders in the church do not have an active, effective, ongoing private communication with God, there's not much chance that the church will too. Worship in spirit and truth doesn't begin with new songbooks. I've seen that. We're going to improve our worship. We're going to buy new songbooks. Really? That, that's method. We're thinking the method's going to solve it. Worship in spirit and truth doesn't begin with new songbook. It begins with the patient teaching of every single member to have a new and open heart to God in personal worship. I love this, the focus on the family idea because it returns worship to where it begins. It begins in the family. That's where it begins. It begins with the father leading his family in worship. This is why Peter in Acts chapter six refused to relinquish his ministry of prayer for the work of food distribution. It was important. We kind of calculated, you know, just, just for a ballpark figure, how many widows were in that church? Well, if you calculate, you know, we calculated how many widows and widowers are here in our congregation and we kind of extrapolated for the numbers that they had there and we figured there may have been around 1,500 widows. And Acts says in the daily distribution of food, you know what kind of benevolence program that is? The daily distribution of food to over a thousand widows? That was an important work. And yet Peter said, I, I, I'm, I'm not giving up my task as a leader, my task of prayer and teaching God's word in order to serve tables. And he wasn't denigrating serving tables. He was saying, that's not the ministry I've been given. And then of course, you know the story, they, they seek out you know, spiritually minded men and they give them this task. As a true leader, Peter was keeping his eye on the core element of an effective church, and that is worship and teaching of God's word. So communication with God, improved worship with God, means that everyone understands that their worship begins at home. And if we don't have a sense of worship and communication with God at home, just, just because we take just because we get 300 people who don't do that at home, it doesn't guarantee they'll be able to do that if we put them all in the same room. I don't know how to play canasta. Well, if you take 300 of me and go to a competition of canasta, I'm not going to be any better at canasta. Communication with God also requires the recognition of God's presence in worship. People who are bored at worship fail to recognize God's presence. People who check their text messages, daydream, visit with their neighbors, or are otherwise distracted, uh, fail to sing, fail to say amen, fail to follow along, do all of these things because their faith in His true presence is weak. Because if they were absolutely convinced that the Spirit of God was with us here, who would be checking their text messages? Obviously, we, we've got to take care of children, fuss, and you know, I, I get that. 
You know, God realizes that the singing may be subpar and the preacher a little monotonous and the babies are fussing. After all, he sees and hears what we see and hear. But he is present in Christ because the church has gathered in his name. We should at least give the same attention to the proceedings that he does. He is present not based on our performance of worship, but rather on his promise to be with us whenever two or three are gathered in his name. Matthew 18, verse 20. We cannot truly communicate with God unless we first acknowledge and respect the fact that he is really with us according to his promise. And then communication with God also requires a sense of ourselves. I know that worship is supposed to be focused on God, but nothing really focuses our minds on God like getting a true sense of ourselves first. Paul the Apostle's most fervent cry, his sincerest prayer, his clearest vision and communication with God is when he declared in Romans 7.24, O wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 8.1, there's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here is a man who's really in touch with himself. Here is a man who really knows who he is. Every man who comes face to face with God, the ultimate communication, the ultimate worship, has experienced this sense of self. For example, Isaiah, who was eloquent in words and counselor to kings, was only aware of his unclean and unworthy lips and words when he was caught up in the spirit before God, Isaiah. What's the first thing he says when he comes before God in his vision? Not, oh wow, isn't this wonderful boy? I sure am glad I'm here. Boy, I mean, you know, no, what did he say? Oh no, he was exposed for what he was. A man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. And John, the faithful apostle who had seen Jesus resurrected, he still fell to the ground as a dead man when he faced the Lord in his heavenly state. You see, the more we see ourselves for who and what we are, the more the Lord opens our eyes to His own glory and the chasm of righteousness and glory that lies between us. And this enables us to experience awe and thanksgiving and relief and joy because then we can see and value the gift that God has given us through the cross of Christ. I mean, when I get a really good look of what I really am, I become so thankful for what I have been given because I understand how unworthy I am of it. And that's, I'm not saying this out of false modesty, please. Only love, only divine love could give to me what has been given to me. This was the problem with the Pharisees. They were so full of their own self-righteousness that they couldn't see their true condition and need. And therefore, they could not see, they could not communicate with, with, with Jesus and what He said and what He did. You know, nothing improves our worship, our communication. Nothing improves our worship with God like a sober and ruthless self-examination. This reveals our need and our need opens the eyes of our hearts. Finally, in order to communicate with God, not an exhaustive list, but I tried to think of the most important things. If we want to communicate with God, we need to know the language of communication. Everything and every endeavor has a language peculiar to itself. Sports, for example, a hat trick. What's a hat trick? Three goals in hockey, right? Or a touchdown. In business, profit and loss statements. Computers, software, hardware, you know, they're, they're, there's a lingo we have to learn. Worship has its own language as well. And it's not cultural, it's not English or French. 
It's a spiritual language. The spiritual language of worship includes the following types of communication with God. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a good sampling that we find in Nehemiah's prayer. So if you're following in your Bible, I have the verse here. Nehemiah prays to God. I'm going to read his prayer and I want you to, as, as I'm reading it, as you're looking at it, try to, try to grasp the different languages of prayer that he uses in just one prayer, okay? So it says, when I heard these words, I sat down, of course the words, I should set it up, Nehemiah hears the news that Jerusalem, uh, the city from where he comes from, uh, the walls are, 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 are broken down and the city is in disrepair and is vulnerable to attack. And so he hears this and he goes to God in prayer. This is his prayer. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What was he doing? Communicating? Trying to communicate? I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love Him and keep His commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king and being successful towards this man, he was praying to God uh, to help him uh, approach the king and to uh, request the king's favor to you know, help him rebuild the walls. Now, have you noticed the languages of prayer? Let's examine Nehemiah's prayer as we uh, close out this first session to see the types of prayer language that he uses. He begins with praise in verses four and five. A short review of some of the good things of God. Then the prayer or the language of supplication in verse 6a, making specific requests on behalf of someone else. The prayer of confession, verses 6b and 7, acknowledgement, review, rejection, and mourning for sins that have committed. Have you, have you mm. Have you ever um, had phase two repentance? Do you know what I'm talking about? Phase two repentance and phase three repentance? You, you think about a sin that you've done, let's say you know, a long time ago. Uh, let's say you stole a car, let's just, something easy, okay? You stole a car, you know, and then you became a Christian and you said, man, I'm, I'm swearing up, you know, obviously, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to steal cars, you know, thank you, I'm baptized, my sins are forgiven, I'm not a car thief anymore in God's eyes. And so, several years go by, and all of a sudden, one day you're in prayer and you realize the trouble that you caused because of your stealing that car. The anxiety and the worry and the stress for the, the person who lost the vehicle, the embarrassment and the angst of your parents and the shame of your family having to go to court with you, the money that your dad had to pay a lawyer and so on and so forth, and you repent all over again. Stage two, repentance. Have you ever done that? That's what happens when you're communicating with God. The Spirit 
you know, opens these things up, cleans them out. I'm not saying you have to repent over again to be forgiven, you're totally forgiven, but you grow in empathy and understanding when you see how and what you have done, how it's hurt other people. And so here he, you know, he's confessing. Not only were our ancestors guilty, I'm guilty, but our ancestors were guilty. We did terrible things, God. And then the language of confirmation, reviewing and claiming for oneself God's promises and blessings. In other words, Lord, you said that you'd give this if I did that and I'm doing this and I'm claiming it. People are feeling guilty all the time. You know, they've repented, they've confessed Christ, they've been immersed. You know, and they, and I've you know, studied with people like, I still feel guilty, I still feel guilty. And I bring them back to Acts 2.38 and I make them read what it says. You know, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You know, is that true? I tell them. Well, yeah. Well, then believe it. <laughs> believe it. Claim it. Go before God and say, Lord, you told me if I confessed your son's name and was immersed in his name, you would forgive me. Not only the fact that I stole the car, but that I shamed my parents and I caused all kinds of trouble and I, you know, things that I did that I can no longer, I couldn't go back and fix it. Claim it, it's yours. He's giving it to you. This is what Nehemiah was doing. God, you said, you, know, you said if we're scattered all over the world, but if we return to you, you said that no matter where we were, you'd bring us all back together. I'm claiming that promise now. That's, that's the language of communication, the language of heaven. And then protection and mercy in verse 11, a request for personal help and protection and mercy in the face of difficult situations or danger. So there you have five different types of prayer, five languages, if you wish, in 10 verses. Now the thing I want you to note is this, this is God's language of communication. God's language of communication is not long flowery words or even the quoting of scripture as you're, you know, I mean, that's all good. This is the language of prayer. The language of worship, communication with God is praise and mercy, supplication, request, confession, confirmation, remembrance. This is what God hears. This is what He answers. Not bands or big crowds or little crowds, not just men praying, but men praying and communicating with Him in the language of worship. I mean, I've seen some men pray that ought to just sit down and be quiet. <laughs> I'm just saying. I never thought I'd ever say I'm just saying in a sermon, but I'm saying it. <laughs> so the essence of worship is communication. And God has shown us in His revealed word that there is a particular language that he hears and that he responds to. And so if our worship has not been satisfying spiritually, it just may be that we're not trying to communicate, we're just trying to be here and go through the motions, or we may not be using the right language to communicate with him. All right, as I said, I, broken this up into a couple of pieces here because I've got too much material for just a 30 minute lesson. So the next time we get together, Lord willing, we're going to talk about the practice of biblical worship. And the practice of biblical worship is not learning new songs. I mean, learning new songs is, is fine. I'm not, I'm not undermining that. But that's not the way we practice communicating with God. The practice to improve our communication is through submission. And we're going to talk about that next week. And so as is our custom, 
If anyone has a need, of course, for one of our elders to communicate with God on their behalf, if you have a need for a prayer of repentance or a prayer of renewal or a prayer of help or a prayer of mercy, our elders are here to lay hands on you, to pray for you in the way you need to be prayed for, but you need to let them know what your need is. And so whether you come forward or put it in a blue card, whatever the need is, the elders are here, the church is here to witness as well, and the Lord is present also to continue ministry to his church. So if you have any needs, we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and sing, and I encourage you to participate in the rest of these lessons. I think they'll be edifying for you. God bless you. <clears throat>